Welcome everyone to the Whole Farm Efficiency webinar series. Uh, my name is Camila Laje and I'm a dairy management specialist with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Southwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. Uh, our topic today is designing feeding programs for dairy profitability. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge and thank you our sponsors, Progressive Dairy Solutions for today's webinar. Uh, sponsorship help us bring programs free of cost to you, and we really appreciate their support. Uh, before introducing today's speakers, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can add questions to the Q&A chat. Uh, if you can leave the chat for tech issues or things like that, it would be better. So we appreciate you putting your questions during Dr. Bradford's presentation on the Q&A so we can uh, make sure to answer them in the end. Uh, and with that, I'm excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Barry Bradford. Dr. Bradford is a professor in the Department of Animal Science at Michigan State University, where he researches dairy cattle's metabolic physiology. With a 50% extension appointment, Dr. Bradford collaborates with dairy producers and their advisors to address questions about dairy farm management. Uh, Dr. Bradford, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can uh, share yours and take, take it over. Thank you so much for being here today. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Camilla. Appreciate the opportunity to be part of this um, webinar series. And uh, <clears throat> I first of all want to acknowledge a couple of colleagues, um, well, a current and a former colleague at MS in MSU Extension. Martine Manguel um, was a core part of this project that I'm going to share um, some of these results with. And Victor Malaco, when he was with our team, uh, put in a lot of time too. So thank you to both of them for contributing. Um, the, the impetus behind uh, this work that I'm going to share is, is really recognizing that many dairy producers have a million things on their plate to manage. They tend to focus a lot on making sure the parlor is running well and often focusing on repro programs and cropping systems. And then, you know, we have nutrition consultants that put diets together and often they're, they're making contributions to making decisions about the rest of the feeding program. They're giving advice. Um, but sometimes that can kind of fall through the cracks. And when feed alone, uh, not even the other costs associated with feeding, feed alone on almost any dairy is going to be at least 50% of the total production costs, and in some cases over 60. Um, this really should uh, demand a, a large fraction of our management focus if we're going to be profitable. And um, you know, it's fine to farm out some of that to consultants and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes then consultants get stuck in a, a situation where they're they're making recommendations and it kind of just become the squeaky wheel and, and um, producers can become immune to those suggestions because they're just hearing it over and over. And um, so sort of trying to bring a, a third party assessment to whether a given feeding program is set up appropriately to be profitable. Um, so, okay, here we go. Um, again, we, we can have a consultant put together the absolute perfect ration for a cow, but you guys have all heard this many times, I'm sure. Um, there's at least three or four diets on a farm. There's the one on a piece of paper. There's the one that's actually mixed. There's the one that's actually put in front of the cow. And then there's the one that the cow actually eats. And in a perfect scenario, those those diets are all identical, right? But that's not really realistic. And we, we try to get as close as we can to that. But there's a lot of complexity to making that all happen. Um, for that to all work well, we have to have um, safe protocols. We need equipment that's working properly. We need feeds stored in places that are allowing them to stay uh, high quality and to not grow molds and yeast. Um, we have to process these feeds to a consistent particle size that's matching what we're expecting. Um, and then, of course, we have to accurately load and mix these diets so that the, the feed put in front of the animals is consistent across the feed bunk, is consistent day to day, and is not getting sorted. So it's consistent even within a day. And again, all that is complicated. And it's it's not uh, it's even more complicated because we're feeding forages with concentrates. The, the moisture content is highly variable across different components of the diet. The particle size is variable across components of the diet. So this is not an easy thing to do. And if we don't do a good job at that whole process, 
Um, we end up with uh, inefficiencies in terms of uh, use of people's time. And of course, as, as a labor crunch gets more difficult over the years, that becomes more and more of an issue. Um, we want to talk a little bit about safety and health. These are certainly areas of the farm where we can put people at risk if we're not careful in how we plan things out. Um, I'm going to talk a fair bit about wasted resources or shrink. Uh, I won't talk as much about it, but anytime we have shrink and we're losing uh, feeds, um, that's going to just contribute that more to the nutrient burden on our farm and environmental challenges around that. Um, and then ultimately, you know, some of these things, doing them right has a huge impact on the ability of a cow to consistently make milk and milk components. And so ultimately, that's why this ties in so, in, you know, intrinsically into how profitable a dairy is. So what we put together, and I'm not going to walk through this in a step-by-step -step type fashion. Um, uh, our team is is open to sharing uh, this this. Uh, tool that we put together if you want to reach out to me later but basically we sat down with a group of us and, and came up with 120 different factors that we thought contributed to the overall quality efficiency um, of the feeding program on a farm and this is including everything from you know do you have high quality ingredients coming in are they maintained in a way that they're not again getting moldy are we preventing um, excessive pest burden. Uh, we don't want birds, you know, pooping all over the feeds. It just goes on and on, like how, how well is the equipment maintained? How efficient is the mixing process and, and routing of trucks through the farm? How well are we getting feed in front of every cow and consistently throughout the day and all this sort of thing? So a lot of factors to consider here. Um, we standardize this evaluation to give it a one to five scale for each factor. And then uh, you can maybe see it on, on this um, snapshot of this uh, initial sheet here. We broke those into six categories that I'll show you in a second. Um, but then after breaking it in categories and kind of seeing where people land in those categories, when we go then talk to the manager of the farm, um, we really have three buckets that we're gonna put things in. First of all, we'd share any safety concerns because that comes first. <laughs> Secondly, we would highlight some short-term opportunities, things that didn't really require uh, much capital outlay, just something that could be changed tomorrow in terms of uh, managing things better. And then, as you might anticipate, some of the big challenges often do require some investment of capital and some planning ahead. And so we'd also highlight some longer-term opportunities that they could consider. Um, over the course of the last two years, um, we've completed, I want to say, close to 20 farms with these assessments. I haven't been personally involved in all of them, but probably half of them. Um, and through that time, we've uh, evaluated farms as small as 180 cows up to 3,500 with uh, quite different feeding systems um, across those farms. And again, we broke each evaluation, each farm out into these six categories. So we were assessing uh, mixing, so how well is the farm doing at making sure we're getting an adequate, accurate, consistent mix uh, of a diet? Um, feed hygiene, are, again, are we seeing yeast and molds? Are we seeing a lot of um, bird uh, effects on, on the feeds? Are we seeing risks of disease from, from the way that feed is stored and handled? <clears throat> Production is kind of a catch-all. Um, basically, uh, our assessment of how well the feed is being provided to animals to allow them to eat as much as they want and to, to hit maximal milk yield and other factors involved in that. Um, I will say we did not evaluate diets. So we we were trying to come in and sort of be complementary to what nutrition consultants and formulators do. We're not evaluating formulations in this assessment. Safety, um, we'll share a few pieces of that, but some of this, especially around silage piles, um, that can be extremely tall and the risks around that um, are things we wanted to point out. Um, shrink we'll talk about a fair bit. And then efficiency is is kind of a broad metric in terms of um, are you finding ways to use refused feed? Uh, are you being efficient in terms of routing with tractors? Um, that sort of thing. So this is just from the first uh, eight farms that we evaluated um, when we 
you know, put this graph together originally. It gives you a sense of where we were scoring these farms. Um, overall, these form, farms uh, range from about a 70% to an 85% in terms of uh, deviation from perfect, I guess. So all in all, you know, these are all farms that have survived many years of, of declining dairy farm numbers. These people know what they're doing, right? So we really didn't go to any farms where it was just a train wreck, right? That doesn't really happen anymore, I don't think. But um, nevertheless, we certainly found areas for opportunity. And um, particularly in shrink, you can see we scored one farm at a 95%. Uh, another was as low as 60%, meaning basically we think there's a ways that you can prevent wasting a lot of feed. And that's where uh, some of the economics really start to hit home. And I'll talk through some of that. Safety, we see a range. Uh, I'll talk about a few examples of things we saw that probably everyone's heard 50 times, but in the busyness of running a farm, it's easy to overlook some of those things. So we just wanted to bring that back to the forefront. Uh, production range here, you can see one uh, was scored quite low. Um, I will talk some about this. One of the main things that actually surprised me is um, we have a lot of work to do even on some really good farms in terms of making sure cows aren't missing meals that they could get. And there's a couple of keys to that that we found. Uh, feed hygiene, uh, not super variable. And then mixing, um, I think it really comes down to equipment maintenance. And I'll show you some photos on that. So when we sat down after you know spending the first 12 to 18 months um, in offering this, this assessment, uh, we came away with four or five main things that we think we learned across multiple farms. So for one thing, like I said, we we looked at about a 20-fold range in terms of farm size. And there wasn't like a, a smoking gun where all the small farms have this problem and all the big farms. It's it's really, um, I, I was a little bit surprised, some really well-respected bigger farms um, that definitely know what they're doing overall sometimes have very large gaps to fix in terms of the feeding program. So I, I don't think it really has a lot to do with farm size in terms of what challenges are out there. Um, I'll show you some evidence that I think if, if farm managers actually take a real interest in one of the aspects of this and really focus on it, and you know, as opposed to sort of farming off all the feeding program stuff to an external consultant, I think it has an impact. And, and there are certain areas where Many managers do focus and you can see that. And I guess my point would be, maybe we can expand that a little. Maybe we can pick up one or two more things to really focus on. And I think it can have an impact. I won't show you much data on this, but we certainly found really variable employee expertise. We met people um, who were kind of the lead feeders on farms that blew us away. You know, maybe their formal education was quite limited, but their understanding of the feedstuffs they're using, their their roles in the diet, their, the purpose of all the SOPs was, was amazing. And, uh, you know, other people, frankly, got thrown into that role because they knew how to drive a tractor and they agreed to take that job, right? And so um, one of the things we're trying to do in Michigan is start to, on a more regular basis, offer sort of feeder training programs, sort of like we've done for milkers uh, in the past. And I think that can be impactful. And then lastly, I'll just walk through some of the math on uh, shrink opportunities and kind of help think through what we might consider on some of our farms. Okay, again, we said, we, you know, we talk about safety first and foremost, just because, you know, if somebody gets hurt or killed, nothing else really matters that much, right? So um, I know I've heard this since I was five years old living on a farm, PTOs. Um, Thankfully, those accidents have become more rare, but we could still certainly find um, PTOs on some farms that uh, were not sort of adequately covered. So we want to make sure that on a regular basis, we're checking those and, and fixing those uh, safety guards as we need to. Um, one thing I think we saw a lot more than we would have 10 years ago is signs around silage piles. And sometimes insurance companies are requiring those kinds of signs. Um, you know, how many people actually read them, I guess, is an open question. But part of the point here is that people that are not on your farm every day, if they're coming to visit for whatever reason, they're adequately warned about you know, risks that they may not uh, comprehend on their own. Um, the equipment on many of our farms today is just massive, right? So um, 
some of the safety things are around that. Um, you can see this employee here in this picture is, is wearing a, a high visibility um, vest. Um, certainly that's a very easy thing that we recommend all farms implement. Um, many farms have sort of standard clothing that they expect employees to wear. Um, often in the past, it was sort of like navy blue or something. Why not switch your standard uniform to something that's high vis, right? A, a bright yellow, bright green, something like that. We've certainly seen farms do that. And if we make it regular where people are just expected to wear that, people do it. If you ask them to put on a separate jacket, the compliance typically is not as good. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I'm not going to share a lot of details, but uh, what we actually witnessed in terms of risky behavior, by far and away, the, the most prevalent problem was people being right on the edge of silage piles, cutting, cutting the plastic back. And of course, to some extent, you can't completely avoid, you know, that job has to be done, but there are ways to take some precautions there, right? So we know people that actually um, will, will sort of, I'm not going to say this exactly right, but uh, sort of drive a stake into the the pile a little bit back from the face and actually attach themselves to it so that if the pile collapses under them, they're actually caught, um, like if you're rock climbing or something. There's simple things like that. Uh, and then there's just, you know, making sure you do the job not right on the edge of the face. Um, and then, of course, one thing that gets talked about more often is, you know, people that are sampling feed or whatever, um, some of these forage piles are 30 feet tall or higher. Um, it doesn't take a 10 foot pile can crush you for sure, right? But um, taking risks by sampling right off the face in those kind of situations is, is just a terrible idea. And we need to find other ways um, to be sampling forages uh, today. All right, so I said that I, I thought I saw evidence that uh, managers that were focused on aspects of the feeding program, um, you could actually see it in, in the things that we were assessing on farms. So one of the data tools that we used was feed management software, um, things like yeah, Easy Feed, Feed Watch, all those types of tools that help us to mix diets and keep track of what's been used and that sort of thing. And this is just an output from, from one of those farms that we looked at. So you can see here, um, they've got uh, pens 12 through 38. That's you know not every single number is used there, but quite a few pens here. And this basically, this graph shows you over the course of a month on the x-axis, um, when was feed delivered to each of those pens? And on the y-axis, the, the bottom is midnight um, going up through the next midnight okay so going through the day as a as the y-axis rises and what this shows is they're basically dropping feed a couple of times for i think all of these pens um but what you can really see here if you look close is somewhere between 6 and 7 a.m um all those pens are getting their first feed drop of the day and other than a few blips in the data here that are probably mistakes um it's it's astounding how consistent those lines are. The the feed drop time doesn't seem to vary by more than maybe 15 minutes. It's a little hard to tell on this scale um, throughout that whole month. So we're getting very consistent initial feed drops. And and for me personally, the second feed drop maybe varies uh, uh, varying a little bit. Probably isn't a big concern because they're not going to be out of feed after the first feed drop. Um, that second drop will affect cow behavior to some extent, may draw them back to the bunk in a perfect world. Maybe it's more consistent, but that doesn't really concern me too much. So not every farm achieves this, um, but this farm, it was a focus again of the manager. We're going to get feed from these animals at the right time. That means we're not off by half an hour and cows are back from the parlor and there's no feed there at their really the time of the day when they're going to eat the most. Uh, on almost any system, that early morning fresh feed is their biggest meal of the day. So being off by a half hour sporadically can be um, pretty detrimental to uh, productivity. So anyway, great example of how we can achieve excellent things on farms. Now, I would also say um, this same software, if you use it to its potential, um, can give you insight into mixing accuracy uh, by employee. And I would say 95% of these farms, we were 
really impressed by the accuracy, uh, the mixing accuracy achieved by the feeders. Um, and these, again, many farms that's become sort of a, a point of evaluation for those employees. It's something that the manager asks them to achieve a, a low variance, a low deviation, and um, then they focus on it. And most of them do an awesome job. And there's even farms that pay bonuses to those employees based on um, small deviations. Okay, so that can be achieved. But <laughs> on the flip side of that, um, if there's a la lapse in training of those people or oversight or those uh, some employees are not receptive to training or oversight, um, these can be really costly problems. Okay, so this is output from one of the farms we evaluated, and it's breaking out ingredient error uh, by feeder. Okay, and we just did a two week window here in this particular report. Um, so you can see there's two feeders here, and if you look at the amounts that they're mixing, the second person is actually the main feeder. This is the person that's doing it probably five, six days a week. And then there's a weekend feeder uh, who steps in as needed. And this is what's kind of unusual. Often, you'll I'll talk to consultants and they'll talk about how um, the weekend, they get a lot more variable results. They have this sort of extra person come in and they're sort of off target and um, don't really know what they're doing so much. Well, that's not what we saw here. So over two weeks, um, the total amount of feed uh, mixed and delivered by that first person was only off by 0.5%, whereas the full-time feeder um, mixed and delivered almost 9% extra feed uh, over a two-week window. Okay, That's 60,000 pounds of feed in two weeks. So this, this was by far the most extreme uh, negative example I saw in, in this sort of metric. So we dug into exactly what's going on in terms of, you know, is it specific ingredients? Uh, is this person dumping extra in of everything? Well, nothing is really on target it, to an impressive degree. But if you look through here, what really stands out for being way over is the soybean meal. So in two weeks, um, this individual had dumped in an extra 17,000 pounds of soybean meal. And at the prices at the time, at least, um, that was about $7,000 over the course of a month, just for that one ingredient overage. Okay. So you scale that out uh, to a full year. And half jokingly, I said, you know, on this farm, you could pay somebody a really good salary to just stand by the soybean meal pile and make that person stop, <laughs> stop grabbing more uh, before they overfed and you would save money, right? Um, uh, so this is what, $85,000 a year, something like that. So... <clears throat> Uh, huge errors. And um, when we shared this with the manager, um, they weren't necessarily aware of this. This is it hopefully became a bigger emphasis after this point. But it was also clear that this was an employee that, um, how shall I say this, was not interested in getting feedback. And so sometimes we have issues with certain personalities. Um, and, you know, frankly, when you don't have unlimited options of employees to bring in if you wanted to let somebody go, you know, that can be a challenge. So there's there's leadership and uh, management issues here as well that are, I'm not going to pretend they're always easy to deal with. But the financial incentives are there, okay. Um, this probably won't surprise too many people, um, but when you're running around trying to put out fires on a dairy every day, and um, Arguably, one of the most important pieces of equipment on your farm is hard to look into <laughs> uh, because your mixer wagon is, you know, 14 feet tall and, you know, the welds are broken on the ladder to go up and look at it and everybody doesn't really have time. Um, it's very easy for things to get way off track in terms of the, the quality of the TMR wagon equipment, how well it's maintained. And in turn, how good of a job it does uh, in terms of accurately mixing and then cleaning out between batches. So on the left hand side here, you can see this is a farm that used some uh, ag bags and they were not doing a good job of cleaning up the plastic and, you know, getting in a hurry, mixing in the dark and ended up with uh, quite a bit of plastic inside that wagon. So um, not only is this going to put extra strain probably on the on the wagon itself, but you know, these pieces of plastic are not helping this equipment function the way it was designed to. Okay. So that's part of it. Um, a, a 
less easy fix, but just as important is making sure that knives are maintained and replaced as necessary. The liners of these mixers wear out. Those those need to be maintained or replaced or, or a new uh, wagon acquired. Um, and even, you know, on the right-hand side, you this twin vertical mixer um, looks to be in pretty darn good shape, but this was between loads and you can see uh, how much residual feed is there. And depending on the diets you're mixing on your farm, that may or may not be an issue, but um, we have some specialized diets on most farms, like think about the close-up ration where we're trying to hit a certain mineral um, composition to cause uh, anionic conditions so that we can help control blood calcium after calving. And if you have a fair bit of residual feed from a lactation diet, and then you're making a small close-up diet because it's a small number of animals, you're really diluting out the anionic salts or, or um, feedstuffs that you have in that diet and having a huge effect on the decad potentially. Okay, so there's lots of stories of uh, transition cow program train wrecks that go back to uh, we're not getting good clean out or we're getting way too much feed stacking up on top of those screws and basically the anionic salts just sitting on top of there and slowly getting dispersed to the lactating cows and the other diets of the day. Um, so these are things we need to look at and um, this is a drone picture as you can probably guess um, and those drones now are cheap enough that Frankly, I think most consult at least one consultant for most farms should be acquiring a drone at this point because they're useful enough for things like this just to take a quick quick peek um, and get a sense not only to look in the wagon sort of between batches occasionally to see how things are going, but also to be able to watch a mix actually being made while which is not necessarily safe to climb up and do um, while while the mixers running. So how do we deal with this other than like having somebody as assigned to actually visually check these things once in a while? You know, the best farms have regularly scheduled maintenance for these things. So just like hopefully you've got oil changes built into somebody's schedule throughout the year for your tractors, um, there should be some kind of schedule where, okay, you know, every six months, we're at least going to look at these knives or, or or just change them on a fixed interval if we kind of know how long they last. And that's going to um, end up giving you much better mix quality. So when we start to get into things that are going to impact production of the cow, feed bunk management becomes super important. Um, I know a lot of farms violate this because of stocking density, but ideally, we would like to give our cows close to two feet of bunk space and at least three to five hours per day, they should be eating, okay? Hopefully they have far more time than that in the in the pen, but they also need time to rest. So if you add that to roughly 12 plus hours that they should be hopefully laying down, um, now we start to see how if we are milking 3X and we've got a long transit time from a pen to the parlor, we can start to squeeze that time budget. So part of this intermingles with the overall management of the cow, but then if we layer on top of that constraints on her time budget, um, if we've got a few hours where she either can't reach the feed or the feed is gone, right, it starts to become an issue. And if we give up one meal, uh, depending on the situation, a typical cow is going to eat eight to 12 meals per day. That missing meal may be smaller than some of the others, but still, if she's giving up five or 10% of her feed, um, that's going to have a real noticeable impact on milk yield. Okay. So um, again, it sounds obvious, but we have to make sure feed is there for cows. And this is where some of these uh, sort of advanced management strategies to try to drive profitability in a really competitive industry can be tricky. So it's become popular, and I'm not necessarily opposed to it, uh, uh, to feed just two or three percent leftovers. So let's say for the sake of argument, you've got a pen that's eating um, you think 60 pounds of dry matter. Um, so in this case, we'd be just feeding what? It's 2%, 61.2 pounds of dry matter to that pen, hoping that um, we can keep feed dispersed across the bunk and that cows that want to eat still can, but not have a huge amount of leftover feed to deal with. Part of the push for this is honestly a lot of people outsourcing heifer raising. So in the past, um, those refusals from lactating cows would get blended into heifer diets. And 
frankly, if, if that's done right, that can work pretty well. And when there's no heifers around and most people don't have any steers sitting around that they're feeding out, it becomes a question of, you know, what do we do with this leftover feed? We don't want to just throw it away, but we don't want to feed it to lactating cows. So it's understandable that people are trying to shrink that down. The thing that I think gets overlooked or, or lost in the shuffle with a hundred things to do is that that really requires excellent management. And I turn to like the feedlot sector. Pretty much if you're running a feedlot, there's two things you got to do. You got to manage the feed bunk and look for healthy events and, and treat those animals. So they they get to focus their efforts much more. And it's very common to feed to almost zero leftovers in the feedlot sector, but they're spending a lot of man hours reading bunks, making bunk calls and that sort of thing. And that is not done as well on most dairies that I've been on. Um, again, here some technology can help us. So this is not going to be news to many people, but um, trail cameras and those sorts of things have become so cheap. And they're a really nice tool for, for looking and asking whether we're doing a good job at this bunk management to actually effectively pull off this uh, low refusal type approach. So here's an example of some camera views from one of the dairies we assessed. Um, if you look at the timestamps here, um, this is basically from three days in the same week. week. <laughs> and on the left side, that's about 1 a.m. And the other two pictures are about 2 a.m. <laughs> And um, what we see here is this is, again, one of those farms where they're feeding to minimal refusals. Um, but you can see, if you look carefully, the pen on the left at 1 or 2 a.m., there's a lot of cows up eating, and there's quite a bit of feed there. Now, by morning, they didn't have huge leftovers. Um, they were feeding to relatively limited refusals there, um, but they weren't running out of feed. Whereas this pen on the right, three out of five days, and that, we just picked these three pictures, it wasn't better the other two days we looked at it. Um, these cows are effectively completely out of feed uh, four to five hours before normal bunk clean out. Okay. So you could ask like, who is missing this? Why is this happening? Well, bunk clean out's happening again, probably at 6 a.m. if I remember correctly. It's very possible that both of those pens had about the same amount of push out. Uh, it's just that these cows were continuing to eat and these cows had nothing left. Well, in the right-hand picture, you can see somebody here is pushing up feed. So somebody's pushing up, um, and they are not noting, as ideally they should have, that this pen on the right is consistently running out of feed. And you can almost see this cow is with her tongue out, trying to scrape in the last few <laughs> bites of feed she can get access to. And again, there's cows up at the bunk uh, in all three of these pictures. They're trying to eat. They're They're missing a meal, right? So we have a problem here. And like I said before, I was surprised how many farms I saw this, farms that are really respected and they're good managers, um, but you can't be there 24 hours a day. So unless you're using a camera or have a really good system set up to keep an eye on feed bunks, if you're trying to shrink down the leftovers, you're at risk of this happening. So how do we handle this? Um, we have to have good communication in our team and that was falling apart on that farm. And I'll show you how we help them in a very simple way to try to resolve that. Um, we need to look carefully at target feeding rates. Um, we have to be careful to avoid a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, so that pen, if that's been happening for weeks on end, their milk yield in that pen, I'm sure, is lower than it would have been. We can then have an iterative process where, based on their milk yield, they're expected to eat less. And so then we feed to less and then lo and behold, the prediction was right, right? It becomes, again, um, we end up with a situation where feed is restricting milk production. That milk production then feeds into our expected intakes. And like I said, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's not what we want for profitability. Um, so we have to make sure we're thinking through that properly. And again, obviously, consistent feed delivery timing is important for this. So if you know you're going to um, consistently deliver feed at 6.30 a.m. and you need to do clean out at 6 a.m., that's fine. But then again, if they're running out of feed at 1 a.m., that's not okay in terms of maximizing milk yield. So what did we help this farm do? Um, we just made a very simple sheet. We had a communication issue partly driven by language barriers here, uh, Spanish employees and a, and a manager that didn't speak much Spanish. Um, so we made this simple laminated sheet um, for the mid or midnight pusher to use and they were asked at that you know 1 a.m time or whenever they push feed up in the middle of the night to just 
mark one of these four scenarios. So we had pictures from across the week at different times of the day um, to demonstrate kind of what we were looking for in terms of how much feed is there. And this is kind of what we wanted at 1 a.m., the enough. Um, and so they could simply see which of these pictures best match the scenario. And then they'd throw this up on a clipboard so that when the person mixing feed in the morning, which in this case was actually the, the farm manager uh, owner, um, they could actually see, okay, I see there's not much now. Uh, how much did they have left a few hours ago? Very simple, but very effective. We're reading the bunk at an appropriate time to make sure we're not running out too early. The other thing is, um, here's an example, and this is this is from a far off dry group, so it could be worse, but still, um, if we're feeding, this may be 5% refusals. Um, but here, this really is refusals. They're not leftover feed. This is what the cows are unwilling to eat. This is the trash they sorted through um, that they're not hungry enough to try to bother with that. Um, and again, uh, most people, you know, notice these things and are processing the silage to try to prevent um, this kind of trash from accumulating. But if that ship has sailed, if you have this kind of feed and they're going to sort through it, you at least need to factor that in as you're determining how much uh, push out is acceptable. Okay, essentially you have to deal with more push out in this case, uh, particularly if they're lactating cows. But it also needs to be factored in when we're considering, you know, the nutrient specs of that diet. This diet as delivered has much more fiber in it than what the cows are actually consuming. And if we don't factor that in, that's also going to be a big problem. So push-ups get talked about a lot. Um, uh, my perspective on this um, is sometimes it gets overplayed in terms of, um, you know, if you want two more pounds of milk, and you're pushing up 12 times a day, go to 18 times a day, and it could it could become absurd and unmanageable. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that. I think the important thing is to do push-ups that are valuable. And I know in this process of going and, and walking and looking at programs, um, I certainly gained some insights into this. So um, we should think about the timing. We should think about the particular diet and and how that influences the need to push up. And you know what groups we're talking about, um, personnel, equipment, and training to make sure this is done efficiently and effectively. <clears throat> so this is a, a sort of a map over time of looking at data from cameras, um, basically looking at when cows within a pen are going to be milked, um, when feed has been pushed in this farm, when cows are mostly resting and there's little pressure on the feed bunk. And then um, when, when there's opportunities. And what meal opportunities refers to is this is a time where cows are coming to the bunk and struggling to reach the feed or not finding any feed. And it could be because of distribution along the bunk. Maybe they hammered the side closest to the milking parlor and that's out of feed. And some cows will come up there and look and find nothing and give up instead of walking down the row. So that's part of it. Um, and then part of it is is, again, just there's push-ups going on sometimes where it's actually not having a whole lot of benefit. And there's other times where um, those cows are wanting to eat feed and it's hard to do. So one thing I definitely learned, I took away is that um, doing a push-up quicker than you think after initial, the first big meal of the day is going to have a bigger impact than adding another middle of the night push. That would be one of my takeaways. So you can see here, um, uh, milking in the middle of the night. There's meal opportunities at 1 a.m. here noted. Some of that may be because of feed um, sort of running out. Um, there's a 3 a.m. push that's probably kind of late to have much impact because there's not much pressure on the feed bunk between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. when feed is pushed out. And what's not shown on here on most farms, what we saw is, let's say they're delivering feed at 7 a.m. Uh, in many cases, the same people that are mixing diets and delivering are coming back to push up feed when they get done feeding, which often meant 11 a.m., 11.30. That sounds fine. That's only a four-hour window. But I was surprised how often there was a massive feed ridge and cows clearly struggling to reach feed by 9 a.m. Um, and it's because, again, cows are often eating 30 or 40 percent of their daily intake in that first meal of the day when fresh feeds delivered, they come back from morning milking. That's what they're habituated to. 
So one of the most impactful feed pushes that gets missed on many farms, I think, is comes at about an hour and a half after that initial feeding. Because um, cows, they're still, and especially if you're overstocked, there's still cows wanting to have their big meal of the day. If they're the second round of cows to get access to the bunk and most all the feed is pushed away, um, we're hurting their productivity. Okay, so again, I think doing this even once or twice a year, putting up some cameras and actually spending the time to monitor cow behavior over 24 hours and think about, wow, we pushed up at... Um, at 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. and there was really no value in that 4 a.m. push, somehow can we rearrange our labor situation so we can have somebody push up feed at 9.30 or 10 a.m. Um, when we have that big ridge? And then again, looking, do we need to train people on feed redistribution? Do we need to be delivering feed at different parts of the bunk at different rates because cows are always um, eating up all the feed sort of on the parlor end or the opposite end. So those sorts of things I think are worth thinking about to make a greater impact with the time that we have. Um, the other thing, this is kind of a general observation. It, it applies to that um, bunk calling uh, scenario, but lots of other things. Um, I think just from an overall management structure and arranging our business, this is a big problem. Uh, especially as some of these dairies get massive, right? If, so if you're a herd manager for 6,000 cows and um, everybody is funneling every problem or question through you, you are absolutely a bottleneck. And this is not an effective way to solve problems. It's not an effective way to empower people um, to find resolutions to problems on their own. Um, it's not a good way to make sure that people have holistic view of the situation when they're helping make important decisions like the agronomist, right? Um, so finding ways to help people all be in the loop can save that person from constraining solutions, I guess, and also saves probably some migraines on the part of the overall manager. So again, pointing to some te technology that can make this easier. Um, there's lots of tools out there. WhatsApp is maybe one of the most popular, but it's super easy to make a sort of a group chat where maybe it's a nutrition group chat and only people relevant to the feeding program are on there, but ideally your external consultants on there. And um, there's a lot of value to this. Everybody sees everything, right? Um, you can put pictures on there, which has value and it's documenting things that you can go back and look at six months later if you need to. Um, if changes are made, they can be noted on here so that people are aware. And then on top of that, we can't just rely on technology. We're definitely would advocate um, getting these groups together as a full team, you know, maybe monthly or even if it's quarterly, but give a chance for people to sit down and say, what are you seeing that you haven't thought to bring forward to people? Um, and then, you know, how can we all work together to solve these issues? And even just awareness has value for, again, for the consultant, for example. So they're not trying to come up with solutions where, you know, the, the, there's an obvious solution if, if you're there, boots on the ground every day, and we just have to communicate that. The last big bucket I wanna to touch on is, is shrink. Um, and maybe this isn't um, as top of mind as it was two years ago because feed prices have come back down a little bit, but um, again, the 20 year trajectory on feed inputs is, um, they, they've gone up at a faster pace than some of the other inputs. And so we saw really all over the map here in terms of how rigorous people are in, in, in trying to prevent shrink. I will say compared to 20 years ago, the average management of silage faces is quite good. I think that message has gotten out there and people are doing an excellent job by and large. We found some farms that could use some improvement, but it's not the low hanging fruit on most farms. This is a picture from a farm um, that really time and, and it's a big constraint that they're fighting. They've got a lot of cows to feed, short window of time. So how do they solve that? Well, like a lot of people, they do pre-mixes. And I think from a mix accuracy standpoint, that makes a ton of sense and it saves you time the next day. The downside here is they don't they don't have any inside storage to deal with anything other than those four commodities you can see. So they're bringing in commodities that are going outside immediately. And then any pre-mixes they're making um, ha they have no choice but to dump it on this concrete pad. And this was a day where it had rained overnight. Um, 
And okay, this this is maybe a little bit extreme, but certainly some days there is no doubt that they're getting 10% shrink on that feed stuff on some days. So if you want to take a little bit extreme version and say uh, that they're going to have that shrink every day, um, $400 a ton is a conservative estimate for a premix with um, protein and uh, trace minerals and vitamins in it. And if you take that 10% shrink on this scale of dairy, that'd be $50,000 per month. Okay. So if you want, cut it by fivefold. Let's say they only average 2% shrink. That's still $10,000 a month. Um, you scale that up and, you know, how quickly do you want to pay off some kind of structure to prevent that kind of shrink and how quickly can you pay for that? I think it's an interesting question to go through. Obviously that math is easier if you're feeding more cows through a given, um, size of com uh, commodity barn, but, um, here's one example, a farm in Michigan that, um, just finished this new enclosed, fully enclosed feeding center uh, probably two years ago now. And at the time, this cost them about 300,000. Unfortunately, I think that structure would cost them well over half a million now. But nonetheless, they thought they paid for this structure in about 18 months. Um, so a structure like this is likely to last at least 20 years. Um, even if it takes you five years to pay off, that's 15 years uh, of profit, right? In response to that investment. Um, so it's worth thinking about, yeah, the, the increased building costs in the last two years are painful. Um, they've made a lot of people hold off and, and change their minds on investments like this, which is understandable. And if you're paying high interest, that adds to it. But still, do the math um, and try to get some estimates of shrink. And of course, a smaller farm, there's no way they're going to finance, you know, half million or million dollar um, facility like that, most likely. But there are some very low cost uh, uh, solutions that can have a big impact. And these, um, you know, I've seen an increasing number of farms uh, go to grinding their own corn grain, particularly if you're raising the, if you're growing the corn yourself and, and harvesting grain um, to feed, um, you eliminate those transaction costs and the storage fees of going to uh, a third party vendor and, you know, the cost of, of paying for the grinding. And I used to be afraid that if we did this, we'd get, um, poor consistency in terms of particle size, um, but I'm actually not seeing that. I, I think people have gotten that message and they know that these need to be maintained. And I've seen many farms do an excellent job with this. And if I'm not mistaken, a, a small version of this kind of uh, grinder can run in the $10,000 range. So very low upfront investment and maybe it helps prevent shrink just because you're moving stuff less, but also again, some of those transaction costs can be eliminated. And again, keeping sort of everything contained until you're actually feeding it. So there's a lot of creative ways to do this. Um, not every way to get feed out of the rain and snow requires a half million or a million dollar totally enclosed feed center. In fact, this farm, if they were just to say, okay, we're just going to build another commodity shed like this, so we've got double the number of bays, I'd be way happier. That for sure is going to help, and that's going to cut down on their shrink better than nothing. So uh, to wrap this up, some takeaways. Um, there's Martin doing all his hard work. Uh, first of all, safety should always be priority one. You're not going to worry about shrink if somebody gets, uh, you know, ends up in the hospital because um, you weren't minding your P's and Q's there. So try to look at that first of all. <clears throat> we can feed to limited leftovers. Um, and in, in fact, I think there's good financial reasons to do that, particularly if we don't have heifers around. But we do have to put an emphasis on buck reading. That should be one of those management areas of focus, in my opinion. Um, evaluate ways to be as effective as possible with feed pushing. Invest those man hours at the right time of day to actually get an extra meal, as opposed to just um, you know pushing up uh, just as a you know fun activity. Um, improving communication using tools can make this easy. I think that pays big dividends, and the cost is next to nothing. Um, and it should save time the next day if you're a herd manager and you've got multiple people to talk to. Um, feed software we found is underutilized on 90% of farms. I understand you have to have a return on the time investment, but for example, when we would have really liked to in this study, took an actual quantitative view of shrink. We didn't go to a single farm where we could get reliable numbers on shrink. Um, and 
again, with this feed software, at least for commodities coming in on a weekly basis, it would actually be quite easy to log in. Okay, inventory just increased by this much from what's delivered from the co-op. Um, you know, and over the course of a year, you could get pretty accurate shrink numbers. Like we had 100 tons delivered, we fed out 90 tons of this ingredient. Okay, we've got 10% shrink. Um, again, every every piece of feed software out there, I believe, has that option, and almost nobody uses it. So. Um, Maybe if you're thinking about investments or you think this is low-hanging fruit to improve profitability on your dairy, that may be a place to start. And lastly, um, I'm not going to tell you this is always true. It depends on how bad your starting scenario is. Um, but I do think even with the high construction costs, um, some of these, as farms get larger, some of these investments in infrastructure um, start to make a lot more sense. All right, with that, I will be happy to answer any questions that have come in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bradford. It was great. I personally enjoyed a lot of like some of the tools you showed, like simple tools and like different ways that people can analyze their data. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very productive. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, we have some questions coming in here, so I'm going to you know address them as they came. Uh, and so the first one is, how do you see the importance of animal monitoring technology supporting the feeding program? Great question. Yeah, um, I assume a lot of that's referring to rumination monitoring, and I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, most of the consultants I know that are, you know, if they're working with 15 to 30 herds are kind of getting a sense of what's normal rumination data and, and you know, are using it already today to kind of see what's going on here, you know, something's a little bit off. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. In fact, um, I think there's room for academics to contribute there in terms of setting some parameters about what's normal, what's not, and how we can interpret those things. Great, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, another question is just like clarifying, when you talk about feeding and overstocking, are you speaking to overstocking at headlocks, like six row barns versus four row barns, or just overstocking in general? <laughs> On a bad, you know, side also. Yeah, I, you know, talking about the feeding program, I was really referring mostly to um, the feed line, and that's a bigger issue in six row barns, right? Because um, you've got more beds, but not more feed bunk space. But you know, overstocking on beds also puts an impact on the on the time budget of the cow, and so it ends up impacting how we need to think about feeding as well. And did you see any uh, difference between like? Among the farms you you visit with this feeding program, did you see any farms like addressing overstocking by doing something different at the feeding and feeding bunk level, management level that you think were helping them address some of the problems that come with like overstocking at the feed bunk level? Not really, other than the the standard, if if they know they're pushing the limits, they tend to be more rigorous on making sure push-ups are done, right? Because they know maybe this cow would like to come to the bunk nine times a day, but she can only get there five times a day. If one of those five times that she can't reach feed, that's a huge problem, right? So that's probably the biggest thing in my mind. Uh, and then there is a question here. Can we add one feed leftover in another time ration? Like, can you get the leftovers on a, on a farm that don't have heifers and add it to another diet uh, without like, compromising the cow's performance? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And frankly, like here at the Michigan State Dairy, we do that. We feed uh, refusals from the high group diet into the late lactation, the low group diet. Um, I don't have a big problem with that. I would say, particularly in the summer, you think about the total length of time that the oldest feed is in, in a feed bunk. So if you're going to take refusals from your high groups and you've got maybe a couple late lactation pens that you're going to put you know, a small fraction of that diet in, then if there's refusals in that late lack pan, especially in the summer, I would dump those, right? I wouldn't keep trying to go down down the row. If we have limited resources, only one stationary mixer, and we offer them before half or one hour before milking, some pens only to manage feeding operations, what would be the possible impacts? I'm not sure I followed that. I'm sorry. So limited yeah, fixing sorry. capacity. We're feeding a half hour before milking. Yes. 
What's the question? What What would be the impacts of of this management on the cow performance? I mean, I I as I understood, it's like having just one a uh, stationary mixer makes make them like being late on on uh, delivering the feed for all the cows. So oh. some of the groups will have just feed, you know, uh half an hour before milky. Uh, and what would be the impacts of this like late delivery or like having cows having like less access to to feed because of this like late delivery of food. That's what I understood. Of feed. Yep. So an analogy I would use, so like, I don't know, I, this may get way off track, but um, like I do, I do often intermittent fasting where you skip a breakfast, right? And if some of you have done that, um, the first, if you're used to eating three square meals a day and you skip the first breakfast, you're super hungry, at least as my experience. Uh, two weeks into it, you don't even notice, right? You're habituated. Your brain gets used to normal things. The cow's the same, and we've done experiments like this, and others have too. So it's more about her knowing what to expect and you being consistent. So um, in fact, one thing I'd like to dig into is it seems like every farm in the country thinks all cows have to be fed at, at dawn with fresh feed. Um, and I don't think there's any real basis for that. I think cows want to eat then, but it doesn't have to be fresh feed. So if you're constrained by mixer capacity, maybe think about what pens do you want to target for fresh feed at first milking of the day? And then other pens get fresh feed at sort of the noon milking. I'm thinking on a 3x basis. But anyway, as long as you keep pens consistent, other than when cows get moved from pen one to pen four, um, I don't think that's going to disrupt things too much. And so that's one way to think about it. If you're not constrained by labor as much as, as infrastructure, maybe spread that work out over the day instead of saying we have to feed everybody between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, if we target for 3% refuses on a 200 cow pen with 300 feet barn, 750 to 1,000 pounds, don't look enough, don't look enough feed on camera, on the feed mud merge, but it is still at least 3%. Uh, let's see if I understood. It feels like when you target 3% refusals when you don't have a lot of cows, it doesn't look a lot, you yeah. know, a lot on, 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 on camera. So how how would people, you know, interpret this on this? Yeah. Type? yeah. No, that's right. And not like like the pictures I showed was probably about that. Um, but my my whole point is you can get used to that and that's okay as long as they're like landing at that point an hour before you feed or a half hour before you feed, not getting to that point five hours before because that same 3% is going to sit there, right? So I think it's okay. And if and again, I'm used to doing research where we want to measure intakes. So we never want them to run out. So I'm used to seeing a lot of leftovers. So it's hard to get used to that 3%. But I do think that's okay. It's just a matter of monitoring them close enough to know they went from 6% two hours before down to 3%. You know what I mean? Right yes. before feeding. And if you are using a tool like the one you showed, you can take pictures of your own farm yeah. so people will get used to that visual on that specific like bunk. Exactly. Yep. Um, what is your estimate on the proportion of farms feeding one X versus multiple times a day? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I th th those things seem to be kind of regional, so it may be biased by you know looking in Michigan, but. Um, I would say it's probably like half and half. And the bigger farms that have to do a lot of loads anyway tend to feed multiple times a day. And I think this is smart. It's like if they have one diet that's going to go to three pens, they can quickly get a small amount of feed in front of all three pens at a very consistent time of day. And then they go sort of can backfill later when it's less urgent, right? So I see that a lot. Smaller farms where it's like maybe each TMR is just one batch. It's more efficient to just mix it all at once and deliver it. And I think that's okay too. I think it's context dependent. Okay. Uh, what are the best times for feeding uh, both in summer and winter for lactating cows? Uh, so what, what are the best times for feeding with frequency a day, both in summer and winter for lactating dairy cows? Okay. Well, I do, I do kind of like if it's possible to feed multiple times a day in the summer, um, and if if you need to save time and, and be more efficient in terms of labor in the winter, uh, you know, there's just less issues with bunk stability and heating and stuff in the winter, right? So I do think that makes sense. Um, on some research trials, we've had to even mix tiny amounts of feed multiple times a day to prevent um, spoilage from starting up. So that'd be, I guess, my quick answer to that. 
Okay. We are uh, approaching 1 p.m., but we still have like a lot, like more questions. So would you be okay with like we answering a little bit more questions and just probably like three more? Yep. Okay. Um, is there any specification for ma material used for feeding table formation? Should it be concrete? It should be of sophisticated material uh, or concrete during feed? I don't know if I understood. Is there any specific for material use? For I think he, the question, the bottom line question is if the material in which the feed bunk is, uh, what is the material of the feed bunk and if that affects the, you know, your feeding management. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is exactly what they're getting at, but certainly it is an issue that, you know, concrete with the acids in, in a dairy TMR is eventually going to become pitted and, and sort of worn away in the feed bunk. Um, in fact, we're going through designing a new campus dairy now and, you know, putting epoxy down can get really expensive, but um, those pits in the concrete is certainly a place that stays wet and that's where molds and stuff want to grow. So there's some feed hygiene issues with that. Unfortunately, there's no super cheap and simple silver bullet for that. I do think um, if you have feed stability issues and spoilage issues, you know, the, that sort of making a smooth surface with epoxy or something is worth considering. Okay. And I'm going to do a, like a last question so we can uh, wrap up. Okay. In a robotic milking system, pushing up timing, is it still important? Yeah, that's a good question. Like you get more consistent, uh, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, you tend to have a, a more equal mix of cows eating and laying down and stuff in a robotic system because every cow's on her own time schedule, right? And that does have some interesting um, implications for all this stuff. One of them is you probably can get away with a little less bunk space, right? Because uh, cows are taking turns more. Um, I also, I think it probably has a bigger impact on feed delivery placement because I've certainly been in some of these barns where cows really hammer the feed closest to the robots because they just don't want to walk down the way to the other end as much. And so delivering feed more where it's getting, where it's running out every day, I think is a very simple, logical solution. In terms of feed push-up, I would just have to watch the individual barn. I mean, it's interesting. Some barns, even if the robots are down there, um, because of airflow and whatever, the cows want to hang out on the other end. And so I think that impacts the overall behavior. Thank you, Dr. Brett, for, for you know, all the, the knowledge shared here today, uh, the presentation. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this is going to be recorded and available on the website for, you know, watching again. Uh, I would like to thank you, Progressive Dairy Solutions, again, for sponsoring the webinar. And I want to remind everyone that next week webinar is going to be with Mary Kay talking about building efficiency and effectiveness into employee onboarding, which kind of goes aligned with a lot of the things that Dr. Redford said here today. Uh, with that, thank you so much, everyone, and I'll see you next week.